uh, is Xiao Sha uh, Cheng from the Ocean University of China on uh, aluminum, the influence of aluminum uh, on hematite properties, magnetic properties, and spectroscopy. So if you would like to share your screen, we'll let you wrap things up for tonight slash this morning. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes? OK. <clears throat> So, uh, hello, uh, it's my pleasure to give a talk here. Thanks, Andrew and Max for your invitation. So today my talk is about the influence of aluminum substitution on the magnetic properties and the diffuse reflectance spectroscopy of hematite. So this is the uh, summary of my previous studies. Uh, today my talk will include this, uh, this four parts. So the first, <clears throat> we know that hematite is one of the most ubiquitous iron oxides in nature, for example. In, in the Earth, there are many, many hematites in the Cretaceous red bass or red soils. Uh, in China, the Chinese Lois Paleosoils, the uh, hematite, the dominant magnetic minerals in the Paleosol, and also in the um, beef, the bandit iron formations. And uh, uh, hematite is also the red color pigment of, him, of the Mars, especially for the red soils and uh, the red, the hematite spheres in the, in the Mars, the blueberries looks, and also the red bass in, in Mars. So it's very important for the Mars and also the Earth environment studies. Uh, for hematite, the basic purpose is uh, we know that this is the stru uh, crystal structure of a hematite. It's the chrodom, chrodom structure. And uh, we know that uh, at room temperature is imperfect antiferromagnetic minerals. With the spin can hit weak magnetization, maybe the uh, saturated magnetization is around 0 0.4 em uh, giga. 0 0.4 and they may be uh, per, per kilograms, and it's also hard magnetic, and the corrosivity can up to one tesla. And also it's high temperature resistance. The nail temperature can up to 690 degrees. But uh, if the, if the uh, temperature, temperature is below his uh, more transition, it will become to completed antiferromagnetic minerals. So hematite is very, very uh, famous magnetic minerals with different uh, behavior at different temperatures. So this, this magnetic, uh, uh, magnetic characteristics can be used to identify or quantification of hematite. Another, another method for hematite identification or quantification is through the diffuse reflectance spectroscopy. We know that the uh, characteristic color is red of hematite. <clears throat> so uh, when, the, when an incident light beam into uh, impinge on the powder surface, a small fraction can uh, is reflected specularly, but the rest will penetrate into the mass as wavelength uh, dependent absorption within colored materials or is scattered. So this part is diffuse reflectance. We can use this information to measure these colored ion oxides. <clears throat> so this is the raw, uh, raw data of the hematite, but we can see that it's very difficult to get information of hematite. In order to quantify, in order to uh, enhance the information of hematite, we can uh, obtain the first derivative curve or the second derivative, uh, de derivative, de uh, derivative curve of hematite. We can see that there is characteristic peak for gauzite or hematite in the first derivative curve or the second derivative curves. It's very known that uh, the hematite and the gauzite concentration is linearly correlated with this uh, amplitude. And this amplitude is 
uh, calculated based on the minimum and the next maximum difference. So this can be used as the amplitude intensity of a hematite. So use this information, we can identify or quantify hematite. Uh, for example, we can use the first derivative curve for hematite is around 565 nanometers or uh, 535 nanometers. Uh, this is the char uh, characteristic peaks for hematite. It can use for hematite identific identification. And also we can use this uh, intensity, for example, at 535 nanometers for hematite quantification. So based on these magnetic or DRS properties, we can, <clears throat> we can use hematite to make paleomagnetic or environment magnetic studies. For example, in the red bath, hematite can carry uh, carry uh, linear interleaves uh, using the uh, through the DRM or CRM. Uh, based on this uh, magnetic uh, magnetic analysis, we can see that hematite can uh, carry uh, can carry code the DRM information around the 670 to 690 degrees. It's a very <laughs> stable high temperature component <laughs> in this part. And also, it also carry a CRM component around 665, uh, 65, uh, 65, uh, 650 degrees. And this is the remagnetization component. So based on this information, we can get the remagnetization information and also the primary magnetic information. So this is use, very useful for the paleomagnetic studies. And also hematite content, it also uh, a proxy for, Asian, uh, for environmental studies. For example, it can use as a proxy for Asian evolving dust. For example, Amazaki and Oka has published a paper in 1975, uh, seven, uh, 19, 1977. They have worked on the, uh, some cores from the North Pacific Oceans. They found that maybe around 35 milliliters, there is uh, increase for the HRAM. HRM can be used as the hematite content proxy. So they see that this increase is because hematite increase and uh, it can uh, use for, <clears throat> it indicates that maybe around this time, the Asian Olin does input increase. So it, uh, it indicates the uh, aridity of Asian inland enhances at this time. Uh, at the same time, the SRM decreased because the magnetism at this place is, uh, is decreased because the formation uh, uh, diagenesis, diagenesis magnetite decreased at this time. So uh, hematite is a very good proxy for Asian Yolen dust. Also, uh, Sarah has uh, uh, talked that it's a challenge to do the deep time environment studies. Uh, he also, she also used these uh, studies to show in, in, his, in her talk. It, we can see that the, this, this work is about the Triassic red bath studies. Uh, in this paper, they use the DRS intensities to indicate hematite concentration. They find that the hematite con concentration increase uh, since the uh, Triassic period. And it correlates, uh, correlates well with the mean annual rainfall. So they, they see that uh, maybe this can be used the can, re reconstruction of late Triassic hydroclimate uh, over the Clarot Plateau. Because <clears throat> hematite, they think that it formed during, in the warm and arid environment. So it can be used uh, as it can be used as the good, pro uh, good proxy for the rainfall. So we can see that this, uh, these studies are based on, are based on this uh, hematite uh, concentration and uh, identification based on pure hematite. It can be also used as a sensitive uh, proxy for the East Asian monsoon. It can be used as uh, it can be used as for different time scale. 
from this figure, we can see that for different different time scale, this ratio can correlate well with the uh, with oxygen record. It's correlate very well. So it's a good a good indicator for the dry wet indicator. So <clears throat> those studies were based on stoichiometric hematite. So what will happen if alumina is incorporated into the hematite structure? We know that alumina substitu uh, substitution is very common for the iron oxides in nature. Uh, Torrent and short they have reported many, many studies about the alumina in these soils. For example, they have published that uh, in, in red soil or uh, paleo soils, there are many uh, alumina substitution in these soils, maybe the uh, largest can, uh, can up to 25%. So, uh, how, uh, how alumina affects the properties of a hematite? We, we, we know there that the stoichiometric hematite, it is a very, very no magnetic properties. But for alumina substituted hematite, it's very, um, it's unclear. So what will happen if alumina incorporate into the structure? <clears throat> we have done many experiments on this, uh, our, our on risk studies, we find that we find that the alumina incorporate into the structure, it can uh, result in many, many uh, changes on the magnetic properties. For example, the magnetic susceptibility it can decrease. It can decrease first from the uh, zero uh, from alumina with zero to maybe around. Uh, eight eight percent, and but at the same time the core safety increase. But if the alumina increase further, we can see that the uh, sus susceptibility increase, but a uh, core safety decrease. It is different behavior, but like a uh, uh, like a mirror mirror, mirror reflections. And uh, for the magnetic remnant, we can see that it decrease. Uh, gradually with alumina content increase and also the near temperature uh, near temperature it also increase uh, it also decreases gradually with alumina content and we can see that if the alumina incorporates into the hematite uh, into the hematite structure it will enlarge the enlarge the uh, <clears throat> Enlarge the temperature range of the nail temperature. For pure hematite, maybe the nail temperature is around this, <coughs> this area. And for magnetite, it's around this area. And uh, this is for magnetite. But for alumina hematite, we can see that it, <coughs> it can put it at maybe around this, this state for these three, three magnetic minerals. So, <coughs> so we think that maybe caution should be paid when identify magnetic minerals based on nail temperature or carry temperature. Uh, in addition, alumina also affects on the low temperature behavior of uh, hematite. It says that this is for pure hematite. We can see there is a moron transition, maybe around 25, uh, 255 Kelvin. But if we uh, add alumina into the structure, we can see that the behavior will change gradually. And the morning temperature will change. And also there is some uh, super paramagnetic part where this uh, will appear. And uh, maybe around here, uh, this particle size may be around 17 nanometers and the particle size behavior pure sp particles and the morning te uh, morning temperature is decreased gradually from maybe 255 kelvin to to around to below one uh, 100 temperature so uh, alumino play a very very great influence on the magnetic properties in addition it also affects the uh, super paramagnetic and uh, a single domain threshold of a hematite. The left is for the stoichiometric hematite. It's the Banach uh, work on nature in 1971. It uh, 
it uh, it gets uh, it gives the threshold for this SP and SD hematite maybe around twenty seven nanometers, but for alumina hematite we found that this threshold is around seventeen nanometers. So we can see that it shifts the uh, shift this threshold to the uh, to the uh, to the finer particles. And also it's um, alumino also effect on the uh, DRS properties of a hematite. Um, when, alumino, uh, when alumino content increase, the lightness and also the blueness will, uh, the lightness will decrease and also, also the blueness will increase. And uh, the character, uh, character, characteristic peak will shift to left and the intensity will decrease. So it influences the DRS properties very greatly. So uh, based on this uh, analysis, we can see that if if it has make so great uh, so great influence on the magnetic properties of a hematite, does the HRM really reflect the hematite content? Maybe we have to pay attention to this question. Maybe alumina substitution should be uh, should be considered. It need uh, should be considered when using these param uh, param uh, parameters for this hem uh, for the hematite concentration. So, what does what's the mechanism of alumina affecting the properties of hematite? Mm. Based on our analysis, we think that maybe alumino uh, influences the magnetic or DRS properties, maybe through three Vs. First is the crystal structure. When alumino uh, incorporates into the structure of a hematite, the, the crystal structure will distortion, will distort, and the whole symmetric will decrease. So the crystal strength in the structure will increase, which will lead to the coercivity increase. So this is why the coercivity increase first as alumino content increase. In addition, because the radius of alumino is maybe around 0 0.53 nanometers, and the radius for iron is around 0 0.65 nanometers. So when alumino into the structure, Substitute the iron. Uh, substitute uh, substituted the iron. The crystal soil volume will decreases. So the cell parameters, for example, A and C, will decrease gradually with the alumino content. And uh, further, the grain size will decrease. Will decrease. So the whole particle size and the whole crystal crystal cell will decrease. This is why the, uh, the magnetic susceptibility and the coercivity will increase uh, further after the alumino content above 8%. 8, uh, 8 and also, we know that uh, for hematite, its magnetic, uh, is, is magnetic, magnetism is from the spin candidate. Spin candidate. If alumino incorporated into the structure of a hematite, for example, into the A site or B site, pref uh, if they incorporate into the two sites prefer preferentially, the mag net magnetization will increase, which we are leading to the en enhanced magnetization. But if alumino incorporated into the uh, structure uniformly, the whole magnetization will decrease because of the uh, because of the iron dilution. So we analysis this with the dilu uh, man, uh, with the dilution experiment. It can find that if the if the alumino into the structure uh, uh, into the structure prefer uh, preferentially, for example, into the shear or into the sear, the dilution uh, dilution uh, rate of alumino and the iron will be different. For example, if into the shear first, it will first uh, at the first uh, more alumino will is uh, more alumino will be dissolved, and uh, if the into the more uh, if more alumino into the sear, the 
uh, at the first dis uh, dissolution, uh, maybe uh, more iron is dissolved. But our experiments show that uh, the iron and the alumino, they have the same, uh, uh, maybe have uh, the same uh, dissolved rate. So we think that maybe alumina incorporate into the hematite structure uniformly. So alumina into the structure, it will make a magnetic dilution of the iron, which will lead into the magnetic remnant decreases. The magnetic dilution. Based on this, we can see that why the magnetic sensibility and coercivity will, uh, will show this behavior. For example, maybe at the first stage, for, him, uh, for magnetic sensibility, this decrease is because of the magnetic dilution. But for coercivity, it's because of the increasing crystal strength. But after the 8% 8, 8 maybe the green size decrease, uh, gradually to an uh, SP state. So magnetic sensibility will increase further and the coercivity will decrease abruptly. So this is why it, it shows different behavior. Then if the uh, alumino incorporated into the hematite uh, so common, so how to identify adequate for him, uh, alumino hematite? Uh, maybe I think uh, for him, aluminum hematite identification, the first parameter is through nail temperature. For example, uh, the nail temperature of aluminum hematite, it can decrease great, uh, gradually with aluminum content. Someone, someone maybe see that maybe for titanium hematite, the nail temperature, temperature will also decrease gradually with titanium, uh, titanium uh, content, but they have different color. For alumina hematite is red, but for titanium hematite is black. So based on this, it's a very good proxy to for the identification of alumina hematite. Uh, in addition, DRS is also a good uh, a good way to identify alumina hematite. We we know that for hematite, it has a characteristic peak around five hundred and thirty five nanometers. So based on the <clears throat> Based on the peak position, we can uh, we can clarify the alumina hematite. Uh, for alumina hematite, maybe it has very low uh, position position. Maybe it shifts to left uh, wavelengths. Then, how to quanti uh, quantify alumina hematite? We know that HRAM is a very common proxy for hematite quantification. But for alumina hematite, we know that um if alumino uh, if alumino content is very high the coercivity may be around uh, tens of uh, tens of millitesla but for hematite uh, for each rm it will uh, gradually increase uh, maybe vary with uh, uh coercivity so uh Tinsu has proposed a, pro uh, a proxy for uh a coercivity variation of a hematite is air ratio. If the air ratio is stable, then HRM can be used as the uh, proxy, uh, proxy for hematite quantification. Uh, for example, uh, this is the uh, sample from Eastern Mediterranean Sea. We can see that the air ratio maybe is stable. It's, uh, it's stable with the HRM. For this, HRM can be used as the quantification of hematite. But for samples from the Western Philippines Sea, the air ratio varied gradually with HRM. So it's not stable. At, uh, it means that at this time, the core safety is varied uh, very much. So it, this uh, HRM is not reflects the hematite content only. So for this some samples, HRM cannot use for quantification of hematite. Also, there is another way for quantification of hematite uh, by DRS. This is a study of 
uh, Peng Xiang from, from GDR, we can see that uh, they have uh, mirrored the alumino hematite with different alumino content. We can see that uh, for samples with alumino content below 8%, the DRS intensity is nearly uh, nearly the same. So it's uh, it means that this this intensity may be very uh, very stable with alumino. So for these samples, the uh, the DRS intensity can be used for the uh, concentration uh, can be used for the quantification of uh, goldite or hematite. So based on these samples, uh, we get the uh, uh, we get the standard equation for the uh, quantification of uh, hematite and goldite. This is is based on the first uh, based on the second derivative curves of uh, DRS, and this is based on the first derivative curves. So uh, this is this means that based on the uh, magnetic and uh, DRS uh, DRS method, we can quantify uh, uh, We can make great. We can make uh, identify and quantify aluminum hematite. So uh, make a conclusion that. It uh, based on our uh, based on this talk, we can see that aluminum substitution can influence the magnetic and the DRS parameters significantly. For, for example, decreasing the magnetization or near temperature or more temperature or DRS intensity or increasing the core safety. And the aluminum affect hematite properties mainly through changing crystal strain or grain size or magnetic dilution, but um, we can still identify or quantify alumina hematite based on magnetic and the DRS method. But uh, in any way, alumina substitution should be considered during using hematite properties for environmental magnetic studies. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Zhao Shao. Fabulous. <laughs> The, the reason we asked Zhao Shao to speak in this session is that, you know, hematite is a critically important mineral in, in everything we do. Yet, the, you know, and in, and in magnetite, we know about titanium substitution and other cation dopants. But in hematite, we don't think too much about aluminium substitution. And it used to be thought that aluminium was not that mobile in the Earth's crust, but, but in acidic environments it is, and soils are acidic. So... Uh, with organic matter. So, so um, aluminium mobilization is really an important issue in, in, in regolith and soil, and aluminium hematite is incredibly abundant. And Zhao ha, Shah has led the world in, in bringing aluminium hematite to, the, to our attention. And I don't know how, how much as a community we're as aware of aluminium hematite and other aluminium substituted iron oxides and oxyhydroxides as we should be. So um, thank you, Joshua, for, for pointing that out. Um, tremendous amount of work that's been done over for more than 10 years from her PhD and uh, with Ching Song Liu. Um, and um, yeah, I, I very much appreciate Joshua's work on this subject. Do we have any questions? Can, can you use the aluminum content to, to uh, trace whether it's detrital or secondary hematite? Did you, I'm sorry, maybe I wasn't clear. Just, I just wonder if it's a good way of tracking whether the hematite is a secondary CRM or a, a primary DRM. Would you expect more aluminum in a secondary hematite formed in a soil or you know, post-depositionally. The red, we, we have a big problem in our field, the, the red bed controversy. When was, when were red beds magnetized? And the question is whether the hematite is detrital or whether it was formed post-depositionally. For the disc, uh, discrimination of the DRM and the CRM of hematite, we have, uh, 
um, purpose uh, methods for this discrimination, maybe through the blocking temperature of these two candles of hematite. For example, the uh, uh, for primary hematite, maybe the blocking temperature is very high, but for uh, uh, for a secondary hematite, the blocking temperature may be below uh, 600, 650 degrees, and also they have different uh, thermal demagnetization behavior. Um, but if the second uh, hematite is aluminum hematite, uh, it will uh, it will based on the blocking temperature, uh, the, the value. If the, uh, the blocking temperature is too low, maybe alumina is inside. But a, a more, a more hematite, a more secondary hematite, maybe it's alumina sub, uh, substituted, is, especially in red soils. Thank you. Thank you. Chao Sha, which, which of your papers did you, did you use that thermal approach? Uh, maybe in the, the paper in, in 20, 2015, in the APSL, yeah. So that's worth a look for people who are curious. Brucey. Yeah, a very interesting talk. Um, I have a question. Do you know, or have you measured the visible reflectance in your hematite powders? Do you know the effect of aluminum on the visible um, reflectance? Uh, I'm sorry, it's not very clear enough. So you mean uh, you mean the DRS of alumina from not, not the diffuse reflectance, but the total reflectance. Now that uh, hematite, you know, ferric oxides, hematite and gertite are strong absorbers in the visible um, wavelength. Um, I'm just wondering whether aluminum affects that by decreasing or increasing the. the the reflectance, because it, it, you know, when the, for instance, when, you know, if ferric oxides are, are, are on snow, for instance, they can absorb solar radiation um, because of their strong um, absorption in the solar wavelength. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether the effect of aluminum um, affects that. Joshua, can you hear? The question is about visible reflectance rather than diffuse reflectance. Yeah. Have you used visible reflectance? No, I, I haven't used, used this, uh, the visible reflectance. I just used the DRS. Yeah. But, but visible reflectance has been used a lot with Mars, yes? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other questions? So, colleagues, um, uh, the overview that Zhao Xia has given today is, is in preparation, nearing submission to, to reviews of geophysics. So hopefully somewhere down the track, uh, what you've seen today will be put in a, in a in a big picture, you know, altogether format. But but of course, I would encourage you all to to read Zhao Xiao's primary papers, which go back to about 2012 or or so. Uh, and there's quite a few of them on the properties of aluminium hematite, aluminium gertite, um, etc. So um, if there are no other questions, I think it's probably very late in Europe and quite late on the east coast of the US. Um, so uh, thank you to the speakers for really wonderful talks. And, uh, and I hope you continue to enjoy the Santa Fe conference. Uh, given that we're all stuck where we are, I think this has been a wonderful way of interacting. And it's nice to see so many of you hanging in there, um, whatever time of day it might be for you. So. Thank you all for your participation.